Hi and welcome back to Batty.com. Today we're going to show you how to fix this 1990 through 1996 Corvette instrument panel. A lot of times people ask me, what would you do to fix this if it were yours? We're in for a special treat. This actually is my instrument panel. You're going to see exactly what I would do to fix my own instrument panel. We're going to use a special in-house instrument panel tester to test this instrument panel. We're going to set it for 1992, 6,000 RPMs, and we're going to start the tests. Okay, the first screen shows us that the LCD panel is working the way it should. If we look here closely, we see it's starting to fade, and that's the real reason for this rebuild. The next screen shows that all segments on the LCD panel are working. The next three screens are the tachometer test. This is zero RPM applied, and it looks correct. This is 3,000 RPM signal applied, and it's slightly high. But at 6,000 RPMs, it's very high. And that tells us the tachometer calibration IC has failed. So that's something else we'll fix during this repair. The first step is to remove the back cover. To do that, we're going to remove the eight Torx screws, which hold the dust cover on. These are Torx 15 screws. They're located here, and 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 here. And it looks like somebody's been into this before because one of these is not a torque screw. This is not a factory screw. So we'll replace that while it's apart. And we're just going to remove those screws. What does it say? The next step is to lift the dust cover. We're going to carefully lift it and not break any of the three plastic tabs which hold it in place. And we'll set it aside. We'll do a quick inspection on it. Uh, I see no corrosion from uh, previous water leaks. That's good news. Uh, corroded traces will typically show up in the lower extremities and can result in non-working bulbs, non-working digital panel. Everything else looks good on this side. The next step is to remove the six screws which hold on the front bezel. Those are located here, 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 and here. These screws are also Torx 15. So the next step, we'll gently lift away the front bezel and set it aside. Next, we're going to remove the LCD panel. We're going to be very careful with this. We're not going to use any metal tools to pry the LCD panel loose, no matter how stuck it is. We're going to hold the red connector at the top and we're going to gently lift the glass away. We're pulling it toward the camera. One thing we need to be careful of are these two tabs. We need to not pry the panel forward that we break the panel in those two tab locations. So we're going to pry it just a little bit at a time, rocking that connector back and forth until it comes loose. And we're going to stop right there. Don't pull the panel any further. Next, we're going to lift the panel at the bottom. And we're going to set it aside. We're filming this at, uh, at this point in 2019. At this point, uh, LCD panels are no longer available as new replacements. Uh, the only source that we have are from uh, donor clusters. That makes them very expensive. Okay, next we're going to lift the color filter and this little black trim piece and set them aside. So you notice I've uh, put the bezel back in place temporarily after we remove the LCD panel. The reason for that is that we never want to lay the instrument panel on the face of the gauges. The next step to get the circuit board loose, is 
we're just going to start lifting the circuit board gently away from the plastic. We're going to start at the bottom. Okay. And so right now it's caught on the uh, LCD connector. We're going to manipulate that and it comes free. And there we see the circuit board. In order to diagnose the tachometer problem, we're going to use we're going to use a multimeter set to resistance. We're going to measure pin 4 and pin 10. And we see in this case it's 269k. The tachometer reading high tells us the resistance of the tachometer calibration IC is higher than it should be. We'll swap this part out with a 9396 analog calibration IC available from batty.com. At the same time, as a proactive measure, uh, we, we know that this, this LCD connector fails frequently, and so we'll swap that out at the same time. The components that we're going to replace again are this LCD connector and this white analog calibration IC. We're going to use the standard kits available from batty.com for these repairs. In order to remove the old solder, we're going to use this vacuum solder removal tool. By popular request, we've made these available in the store. If you don't have one already, they're totally worth it. We're going to remove this light bulb and this light bulb for clearance. We'll use some of the solder supplied with the kit. The reason we add a little bit of fresh solder is that it also adds rosin and that extra rosin changes the viscosity of the solder and helps it to flow. So I'm going to simultaneously heat the junction between the pad and the post of the component. I'm adding a bit of fresh solder and then I use the vacuum solder removal tool to remove the solder. Okay, and when we've removed all of the solder properly, the component should just fall away. In this case, it's got a bent leg that's keeping it from doing that. But when we've removed all the solder properly, the component will just drop away. Okay, the next step is to remove the LCD connector and again we're just going to apply some heat some fresh solder and we'll use our vacuum solder removal tool to suck away the old solder Okay, we'll use a small flat blade screwdriver to gently lift the connector away from the board. And we'll set the old part aside. The next step is to install the analog calibration IC. To do that, we're going to move the capacitor above that calibration IC up slightly and we'll press it into place. Then we'll turn the board over. Next we'll solder in the new IC.
we'll tack the corners first. And again, the way I'm doing this is I'm just applying heat at the junction of the pad and the post. I'm feeding in a small amount of fresh solder, very small amount, less than a sixteenth of an inch, I'd say. And then I remove the heat. Okay. Uh, there is one pin where uh, there's not a, a pad to solder to, and we'll just leave that alone. We won't solder that connection. All right, here we see the installed analog calibration IC. This is the way that it should look. The square resistor pack should be at the top of the circuit board. Next, we're going to install the LCD connector. If we notice, the set of holes is offset to the bottom as we're installing this part. We'll see an orange wire with a marking that says pin 1 on the connector. We'll install that orange wire in pin 1 and then we'll install each additional wire. What we see is that the orange wire has been inserted into hole 1. The second wire has been inserted into the second hole. We make sure that we don't have any crosses here. Wire number three is in hole three. Wire number four is in hole four. Down the line through wire number ten in hole ten. The next thing we'll do, we'll maintain pressure on this to hold it in place while we turn the board over. All right, we're going to turn the board over while we hold that connector in place. We're going to make sure that none of the wires came loose during that process, that all of the wires are poking through the circuit board, and that they're roughly perpendicular to the circuit board as, the, as they come through. We'll solder the end wires in place first. We'll apply heat, apply a small amount of fresh solder, and then remove the heat. And if everything looks good, we'll go ahead and finish up all 10 connections. We want to make sure that we don't have any bridges through here. A bridge would be a connection between any of the two wires. We don't want to apply so much solder that we create a solder bridge and connect any of the two wires to each other. We want to use as little solder as possible because we are dealing with high-speed computer signals. Once we have those connections soldered, we're going to trim them with a pair of wire cutters. We're not cutting into the solder joint, we're just trimming off the extra wire protruding above the solder joint. Okay. Next we're left with a little bit of flux residue on the board. I'm going to take some 91% isopropyl alcohol and just apply a little bit to that area. And I'm going to use an old toothbrush. This is a nylon bristle brush, but you can use an old toothbrush or uh, anything you want here to just kind of work the alcohol in. We'll do the alcohol, we'll do a couple of passes with the alcohol. Okay, we'll just let that drip dry. If we have some compressed air, we can clean off the alcohol. Next, we're going to reinforce this connection. You might choose some silicone glue to, to reinforce this connection. In our case, here in the shop, we're going to use hot glue. And I'm just going to apply a bead of hot glue at the base of those connections. I'm going to turn it around. Okay. And I'm going to apply another bead of hot glue on this side. That will help to reinforce the connection between those wires and the circuit board. We're going to let that cool and we'll reinstall our bulbs. A common source of failure in this instrument panel are the solder joints that go between the circuit board and the wiring harness connector. There are 34 of them. This frequently results in non-working lights 
and uh, intermittent LCD panel operation. So we're going to go ahead and redo those solder connections while this is a part for the other work. It was a lot of work to take the instrument panel out and we don't want to do it again anytime soon. To do that, again, we'll apply some heat and some fresh solder and we'll use our vacuum solder removal tool to remove the solder. We need to get rid of the old solder first. The old solder is brittle. Next, we're gonna apply heat between the post sticking up out of the hole and the pad around the hole. We'll feed in a small amount of fresh solder. We'll remove the heat. If you don't have to remove the instrument panel again, it's totally worth the time that you spend here. And again, we're feeding in just a small amount of solder, maybe a sixteenth of an inch for each of these connections. There's some extra solder included in either of the, the kits that you saw used here today. We want to make sure we're using a lead tin solder, not a lead free solder. The reason for that is that the lead free solder becomes brittle over time and the, the lead tin solder is relatively immune to that. And the, uh, the lead tin solder is also much easier to work with. Here we see the soldered joints. There are actually two pins where there's, there's not a pad to solder to and we're going to leave those as they are. We do not solder those connections. Next, we're going to use some 91% rubbing alcohol and our nylon bristle brush to scrub away the excess flux. The solder joints all look nice and bright and the flux residue is gone. So I think at this point, we're ready to clean things up and reassemble. All right, before we reassemble this, we're going to clean the light bulbs. Uh, a light coating of dust is very common on the light bulbs and that can make the, uh, the instrument panel much dimmer. So we're just gonna clean these. What I'm using is a paper towel and some standard glass cleaner. I'll just spray it on the paper towel and clean each of the bulbs. We can see the dirt that I got off of those. At this point, we're gonna calibrate the analog IC. That is necessary because each and every one of the uh, factory needle movements were different. Originally, they used a laser process to calibrate a resistor. In, in our case, we have replaced that with a, an adjustable resistor, which is located here. The TAC calibration IC is going to come set within a few hundred RPM of being correct. If you want it to be exact, then we need a way to do that. One way can be to set the LCD panel to display RPM if your, your car has that function. Another way is to use a scan tool or anything else that can measure engine RPM. What we'll do is rotate the control on that resistor until the analog needle matches the actual engine RPM. So here in the shop, the way we do this is we made a little extension that extends the tachometer needle movement so that we can adjust this board and view the results live. We've set our cluster tester for 6,000 RPM and we see the factory needle is very close. We're gonna adjust it very slightly and again, we'll bounce the needle back and forth. It almost looks like this needle is sticking. So we're going to use a small flat blade screwdriver to gently pry it slightly away from the face of the gauge. And we'll adjust the resistor until we see consistent results that are exactly aligned with the signal that we're applying to the cluster. In this case, 6,000. We'll back off to 3,000, and we see it aligns with 3,000 exactly. We'll go back to zero, and it aligns with zero exactly. In this case, we have repaired the problem with the tachometer calibration. 
Next, we're going to show you how to replace the polarizing film on this LCD panel. Uh, we can see that um, in order to protect the pins on the back side of this panel, I just have this hanging over a book. It wasn't a very interesting book, and I think this is probably the most use that anybody's ever gotten out of it, is to protect the traces along the top part of the glass panel. We're going to be working with a razor blade, and we can't damage those, and if we do, we can't fix them. So we're going to put a couple of layers of electrical tape over them. It's easy to remove and it'll protect them from the razor blade. The next step is to turn the panel over and we're going to use a sharpie and we're going to mark where the line that divides the speedometer window from the odometer window is. And This is just going to help us line up the graphics when we reapply them later. The next step is to get rid of the old film. We're going to take one of the razor blades from the kit at a very slight angle in between the glass panel and the polarizing film. We're going to peel the film away. We'll get that started. And we're just going to peel the film away. We're going to be very gentle about this. We don't want to put a lot of pressure on the glass. The glass does have some channels inside of it which carry the charge for the liquid crystal and we want to be, be very careful not to break those channels so we're just peeling the old film away sometimes it peels away in one piece like this and sometimes you'll have to use the razor blades to scrape multiple pieces off we're going to use as many razor blades as is necessary to clean the surface of the panel completely. We're cleaning the old glue. We're cleaning any old polarizing film that's still stuck to the, the surface. We're being very careful that the razor blade does not go off of that edge of the glass panel. So we're going to wipe it with a dry paper towel. This is going to get some of the additional glue residue off. Any glue residue, any dust, any old film material that's left will cause spots under the new film that look like air pockets. So we want to avoid that if at all possible. We do that by making sure the panel is as clean as possible. We're going to spray it with Windex and then we'll use another razor blade the wet cleaning process. Make sure that every last little bit of glue and film residue is gone. And then we'll clean it again. Next we're going to make sure that nothing spilled over to this back side or onto our precious book. We're going to make very sure that the panel is entirely dry. before we start this next step. When we do this here in the shop, we typically go through three to five razor blades. We typically go through a few paper towels. Here we see the contents of the 1990 through 1996 Corvette LCD restoration kit. You can go to batty.com and click on parts to purchase this. The kit includes a top polarizing film, a bottom polarizing film, replacement factory graphics. The kit includes an alcohol swab for cleaning the film before applying the factory graphics. And it includes a few razor blades. Depending on the severity of your repair, you may need to purchase additional razor blades to finish the repairs. The kit includes a piece of film marked top. It has a directional arrow that indicates that this, the sticker says, Remove this side first. By removing the sticker side first, we're not going to expose the glue. We're just getting the sticker out of the way. The sticker does interfere with application. The kit also includes a new piece of film marked bottom. The bottom film is intended to go on the back side of the panel, the one furthest away from the driver. And again, it has a directional arrow indicating that this side should be applied to that portion of the panel. Essentially, 
like that. It's the first step to applying the film is to thoroughly clean the panel. The next step is to peel the protective film off of the non-glue side. Again, we haven't exposed the glue yet. Then finally, on the rear, there's another protective film. We'll peel that second protective film halfway. We'll make sure that we don't touch the glue side at this point. The glue side is down. We'll align the bottom of the film with the bottom of the panel. Swipe with our finger to hold it in place. And then we'll use the roller to roll it the rest of the way on. The top film is intended to be installed on this side of the panel. In that orientation. And the bottom film is intended to be installed on the back side of the panel. As we see here. And it's intended to be installed in this orientation. After the film has been installed and before we apply the factory graphics, we use the alcohol swab to clean this surface of the top film before we apply the factory graphics to the front side of the panel. We're going to apply the top panel to the top surface of the glass. We're going to use some compressed air to do a final cleaning on the panel. Make sure that any dust that's landed on the panel since we scraped it clean is gone. Then we're going to apply the top film and we're going to use our brayer. This is a rubber roller in order to apply that film. By popular demand, those rollers are available in our parts store for a very reasonable price. We'll peel the film halfway. We'll, we'll, do, a, we'll do a quick cleaning. We'll get the bottom started, and we're going to slowly roll the new film into place. And it looks like that's gone down the way that it should have. There are no dust spots. If there are any air spots, the film is sometimes liftable. You might try lifting the film and re-rolling it. Uh, if it's an actual dust spot, the, the dust spot is probably going to be there forever. If that happens, contact us and we'll hook you up with a new piece of film. So next we're going to use one of the old razor blades. We're going to hold that at about a 45 degree angle to the side of the panel. We're going to trim that film flush with the panel. We're going to be very careful up here at the top so that we don't damage any of the traces on the glass. We'll do the same thing for the other side of the panel. We'll trim the bottom to make sure it's flush. We're going to be careful when we trim the bottom. And we're going to make sure we hold that razor blade at a 45 degree angle instead of flush, instead of perpendicular to the glass. And the reason for that is that the seal for the liquid crystal chemical is here on the bottom. And we definitely don't want to scrape that off of the glass panel. Now we have the film trimmed. The kits include an alcohol pad in the razor blade kit. It's really the same thing as using rubbing alcohol and a paper towel to clean the surface of that top film. The reason for this is to improve the adhesion of the factory graphics. Next, we're going to trim one edge of the factory graphic so that the black factory edge is the very edge of the graphic. We're going to peel the backing away. We're going to hold the graphics in place. We're going to line up that right edge with the edge of the glass panel. We're going to make sure that the odometer line is lined up with the sharpie markings that we drew earlier. And then we're going to roll that into place. 
Once that graphic has been applied, we're going to use an X-Acto knife to help peel away. Once we get that started, we're just going to roll that away very carefully. If we have any bubbles or warping of the graphic, we can use a heat gun. This is a, this is a 250 watt heat gun, so it's, uh, it's even less heat than a hair dryer would be. This is not the same thing that they sell for stripping paint. We're just gonna very gently apply some heat to the factory graphic, and those bubbles just go away. So we're going to give you a close-up of that. There we go. That's what it looks like when we're done with the top side. I'll try to show you that at an angle here. Next, we're going to focus on the back side. The traces aren't on the back side of the glass panel. And so we don't need the protective electrical tape. We're going to use a razor blade and again we're just going to lift that film away from the back side of the panel gently. Okay, we'll use a razor blade to clean that glue residue off the back side of the panel. There's nothing special about the razor blades in the kit. If you need more razor blades, you can source those locally. And again, we're just kind of polishing away some of that glue residue. That residue is hard to see here on camera. It's pretty obvious when the panel's right in front of you. Again, we want this as clean as possible in order to prevent dust spots and air bubbles in the film. When we're confident that we've got most everything off, we'll spray it with uh, glass cleaner and do a wet scraping. This adds a little bit of lubrication that helps get the last little bit of glue residue off of the panel. And then we'll just clean the panel with a glass cleaner and a paper towel. Do a real careful examination on the panel. And if you see any, any spots left, stop. For us, that's the case. I do see a spot that's left behind after, even after all that process. It's right here in the corner. So we're going to address that before we apply the film. We want to make sure both sides of the panel are dry. The book's dry. Before we apply the bottom film. To apply the bottom film, we'll remove the top protective cover first. This is the side with the sticker on it. We haven't yet exposed the glue. Next, we'll peel the glue side back about halfway. We're going to do a final dust cleaning with our air duster. We'll line the bottom of the film up and press it on with our finger. And then we'll use a roller to apply it the rest of the way. And again, we did a good job cleaning it because we don't see any dust spots. We're going to take one of the old razor blades and trim the bottom film flush with the edge of the panel on all three sides. And again, we're holding this at a 45 degree angle to the, to the glass. And the reason we do that is we don't want to trim off the fill hole for the uh, LCD chemical. I'm going to try to show you this a little bit better. Okay. Let's 
trimmed flush on all three sides. No air spots. And it looks great. Here we see the final product. The LCD panel with new polarizing film has much improved contrast. Information looks black instead of gray and it's much easier to read. Next, uh, we have a small spot on the face of this gauge. We're gonna clean that. We're using, again, uh, some paper towel and some, um, some ordinary glass cleaner. All right, and that looks pretty good. We place the, uh, the gauge back onto the bezel just for resting purposes, for assembly purposes. We're going to reinstall the circuit board. We're going to gently press the circuit board onto the pins of those analog gauges. Next, we'll clean up the color filter. In this case, I'm just using some compressed air in order to clean the color filter. We're going to place it face down on a piece of paper towel. We're going to hold it down and we're going to liberally apply some alcohol. This is going to get rid of the foam residue. We're going to rub the foam residue into the sides of the paper towel. This should keep the face relatively clean. We're going to throw that paper towel away and go to a clean paper towel and repeat the process. To get any dirt, any foam residue off of the back side, this will give us a nice bright even orange glow behind the LCD panel. We're going to let that completely dry before we reassemble things. Next, we're going to reassemble. We put the light gasket first and we make sure that it's in this orientation with the notch around the connector. We're going to install the color filter next. Both of those are behind these two tabs. Finally, we're going to reinstall the glass panel. We're going to be very careful here. We're going to slide it behind those two tabs. We're going to make sure that all 10 pins are lined up with the, the new connector. We're going to make sure top of the glass panel is below this white plastic tab that's sticking out. It is very common to see these panels broken in this location. And we're going to gently press the panel into place. When clusters come into the shop for us, we'll do a final polish on the acrylic cover. This doesn't get rid of um, spotting that happens due to uh, chemical products sprayed onto the acrylic lens. The only thing we found to get rid of those is really just to replace it. Um, but if it does have some light scratches or some dirt, uh, it, this is a great way to clean the lens up. We're going to use Meguiar's Plast-X. This is a clear plastic cleaner and polish. And we're just going to apply it liberally. We're going to use a paper towel. This is folded over like eight times in order to rub the Plastex into the surface of the panel. We're just going to distribute everything all over the outside. Okay, get the edges, great. We're going to fold the paper towel again and we're going to do small circles to polish the lens. We're not going to show you the whole thing but we're going to spend about five minutes polishing each side. As the plastic polish dries, more and more of it will be picked up by the paper towel and we'll see the white haze turn to a clear lens. This one cleaned up pretty well.
If your instrument panel needs to have the uh, inside clean, just take these six screws off and clean the other side of it before you put it all back together. Next we're going to place the front bezel on the instrument panel. We're going to make very sure that this glass panel is completely below this plastic tab. If it's not, when we reassemble things, the panel will crack and it will have to be replaced. Next we'll install the six screws that hold the front bezel in place. Those are located here and here and here and here and here and here. We'll do the top one first. Okay. After those plastic tabs have been installed, we'll place the eight screws that hold the protective cover in place. Those are located here, and here, and here, and here, 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 and here. We'll tighten those down. The LCD panel lights up like it should, easily red. We see that the LCD panel is nice and contrasty. Tachometer reports zero when zero RPM are input. 6,000 RPM when a 6,000 RPM signal is input. We see that all of the analog gauges are approximately centered. These are set by artificial senders inside the instrument panel tester and show us that everything is working the way it should. All of the telltale bulbs around the edges and all of the gauge face illumination bulbs are working properly. I'd say this is a proper repair. Here we see the working instrument panel. We're going to check to make sure that all of the segments of the LCD are working. We're going to make sure that the tachometer responds 0 RPM when we input 0 RPM, 6K when we input 6K, and that it goes back to 0 when we're done. We're going to check the analog gauges to make sure that they're roughly centered, and they are. Um, if you have a 90 or a 91, the oil temperature gauge uh, only goes to 260 degrees, and so it will appear to be uh, uh, pegged, but uh, they're both displaying the same value. We're gonna check to make sure that our illumination is bright enough on the faces of the gauges. That's sort of hard to see here, so we're gonna change the exposure. We're going to check to make sure that all of the indicator lights around the perimeter of this gauge are working the way they should. We're going to check to make sure that the indicators left, right, and high beam are working, and they are. We're going to make sure we have even illumination across the LCD screen, and that when it's displaying data, it looks correct, and it looks beautiful. This is another successful instrument panel repair from Batty.com. If you'd like to purchase the parts or the tools that you've seen us use here, you can go to our website. That's batty.com, B-A-T-E-E.com. My name is Brian Thompson, and I founded the website batty.com, where you can find more free information and videos to fix Corvette electronics. You can also find the parts and tools you see us using in the videos. Thanks to your support, I'm proud to say that 10 Americans have jobs. Hi, friends. 20 years of experience can make these repairs look easier than they really are. But don't worry, we have your back. If you're not getting the results you see here, then stop and pack it up and send it to us. We have the parts, the tools, and the experience needed to do the job right.